David Brazewood, I'm from the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, talk, which is part of the Poses Lectureship Series, and uh, that uh, that uh, series is made possible, of course, by the by the uh, uh, generosity of the um, of the Poses family uh, in memory of the people whose um, original uh, generosity made the lecture uh, series possible, namely uh, the the families of Shell and Louis Poses. Uh, we're very proud to um, to offer you tonight a talk by Alon Ta. Before I introduce him, I just want to let you, let you know that in March, early March, 9th to the 11th, I believe, we will have uh, a very, uh, I think, uh, successful uh, Israeli novelist by the name of Noah Yedlin. She has written a, a novel that was recently issued in English called Copenhagen, and it was made into a very successful um, TV series. Uh, so we will have events around uh, her appearance here. For now, we are very happy to have Alon Tal, who, was, who is originally from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, but has been living in Israel for many years. He is an Israeli environmental politician, academic, and activist. Uh, he is known to many American Jews as a former member of the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament, serving between 2021 and 2022. Uh, under the or representing the blue and white party, uh, of, uh, of, of Benny Gantz, his uh, if I'm not mistaken, his former commander in the army, right? Yeah, so, um, anyway, uh, notably, uh, Alon Tal is founder of the Israel, Israel Union for Environmental Defense and the Araba Institute for Environmental Studies. He's also the co founder of several NGOs that have to do with the environment, including Echo Peace, Friends of of the Earth, Middle East. This is my Earth, the Israel Forum for Demography, Environment, and Society, a team, ecological Judaism, and the Green Movement. Okay, so this has been a very busy <laughs> decade or so. Uh, uh, recently, uh, Tal was appointed a chair of the Department of Public Policy at Tel Aviv University in 2017. Uh, so uh, please welcome Alon Tal. If you have questions, uh, please, uh, and you're online, please put them in the um, Q&A section of the Zoom room, or uh, put them in the chat section. We'll be happy to relay them. Uh, so thank you, and welcome, Alan. Well, thank you all for coming and for signing up. I want to thank David for hosting me, and Jackie for doing so much of the legwork to welcome me, and really also to my dear friend, uh, Professor Sharon McDowell, who has been a colleague and inspiration for many years. Um, today, uh, we start this talk, and the sun is about to set. And when we finish the lecture, presumably, we will be celebrating Tu Bishvat, the 15th day of Shvat, when we celebrate the birthday of the trees. And so it would be remiss at a lecture sponsored by the Department of Jewish Studies not to say a word or two about trees. And I think I have another presentation this evening where I'm going to say a lot about that. But I would like to say the following, because I'm supposed to talk today, the topic that was selected for my lecture was the future of Israeli democracy creating a consensus, which is something that we need to spend some time thinking about. And we can gain our inspiration from the trees. Many of us know that on Friday nights and many other uh, times of the uh, year, we say a certain section of the Psalms, and it's also a famous Israeli folk song, Tzadik HaTamar Yifrach Ke'erez Balvanon Yizkeh. The righteous shall flourish uh, like the palm tree, and they will spread like a uh, cedar tree. And that's like a say time after time, but rarely do people stop to think about that. You know, cedar trees and palm trees, they don't have a lot in common ecologically. Cedar trees need a lot of rain, they need cold weather. Then generally we talk about cedar trees of Lebanon, which is very, very different in the microclimate than the natural ways that palms flourish in the desert. So what's going on here? So to understand this conundrum, you have to go further into the next line of test, which is Shtulim Bevet Adonai, that both Palm and the cedar are planted in the house of the Lord. In other words, if you want to have a garden or a national woodlands, which is truly blessed by the Almighty, you have to have diversity. And we all know that in ecology, 
The first rule is, is monocultures aren't going to do it for us. We're going to have to have diversity. And I would like to argue that the future of Israel as a society is our ability to recognize the blessing of diversity and how much more interesting it is to have different cuisines and perspectives on life and how we have to learn to respect each other. So that's sort of an underlying scriptural uh, context for what I'd like to talk about today. And I'd also like to talk a bit about uh, my daughter, Zoe, um, who has been uh, a light in my life for many, many years. I'm delighted, finally, after months of delay, she began her studies at Hebrew University as a law student, a uh, special program for law and MBA they have their second generation at the Hebrew University Law School. So, um, and I think about how peculiar her life has been during the past year, because my daughter, Zoe, is of a generation who spent nine months on the streets of Israel protesting a government that they were concerned was going to dismantle their legal system. And uh, I remember her sending me at the time photographs I was out in the country where they were sitting bonfires in some of the biggest streets, and she lives in Jerusalem, uh, the Gaza Street, it's the same street that Prime Minister Netanyahu's house there, and they were on the barricades for nine months in what probably was the most divided time in Israeli history, when the danger of civil war was palpable. And then the 7th of October. Immediately, uh, after she recovered from the disappointment on the 8th of October that she that several of her friends had been called up to reserve duty, but she was not, uh, she went to work in the war room of Jerusalem. For those unfamiliar with what happened in Israel, the... Hamas attack not only caught the military unprepared, uh, but also a lot of Israel's social agencies. And overnight, Israel had about 160,000 refugees. And this was a uh, situation nobody was prepared for. But yet, Israeli civil society uh, had already been very, very engaged and organized and full of all kinds of chat groups, whatever. And within a day, they had war rooms, the most famous one being in the Tel Aviv Expo, where basically thousands of people came in to volunteer and out of individual donations provided the mattresses and the school books and the tutoring and the psychologists and anything that all these refugees needed. And in fact, used AI experts from Israeli high tech to identify who was a hostage and who wasn't, all kinds of things were going on. Jerusalem was the poor cousin of that, but there's 60,000 refugees now in Jerusalem. And they needed help. And so for 12 to 14 hours, she and her boyfriend, along with dozens of other students whose university careers had to be delayed by several months, spent working during a period which could be characterized perhaps as the most unified period in Israeli history. It was unimaginable how the pendulum could swing so dramatically in so uh, short a uh, period of time. And what was clear, along with the horrible trauma that Israelis felt by the most bloody day in their history since the Holocaust, there was still a sense of satisfaction and relief that we needed it most, we did come together. Against the worst uh, scenarios of the Hamas who assume that once they take this shot at us, we're gonna go at each other's throats. On the contrary, we closed ranks in a beautiful, beautiful way. And Israelis realized how important unity and consensus is. This was very, very important. How we'd all been traumatized. Nobody loved having a society that was so divided, in this case, over the, the proposed judicial reform. The political expression, and although I'm an academic, I also spent a lot of time in politics lately. The political expression is what happened to my party, the Blue and White Party. Because if you look at the present Knesset, we only have actually eight seats out of a 12-person faction um, that Benny Gantz is the chair of. That's what we got elected a year and a half ago. But if elections were held today, according to the poll that came out two days ago, we'd have 37. So our note would be 37 and 40, which says that Israelis, why do they have this tremendous thing? Because Benny Gantz decided that he was going at this time of unparalleled national emergency to join the Netanyahu government, even though he had done that in the past and the chicanery of Netanyahu had had uh, led to his almost political elimination because he was shown to be some sort of, and then he was shown as a stooge and none of the promises were kept. He said, I'm gonna have to put all that aside because we need unity now. And the pundits, the nights before he made that decision, all saying he would never do it, it would be political suicide, fooled me once, 
Shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And he did what he thought was right for unity. And his political support has increased by 400% more, actually. So, so this is something which reflects, I think, a strong impulse in Israeli uh, political culture today that we want to find a ways to bring things together. Um, the truth of the matter is, is, having spent a little time in the Knesset, rivals, political rivals, sometimes get along better than you'd think. I'm often, uh, I often surprise people when I tell them certain stories of who my partners were on different issues in the Knesset. For example, there's no figure who's considered more of a Darth Vader by the Israeli center left than Yariv Levine, our Minister of Justice, who is the architect and chief advocate for the judicial reform. But I will tell you something good about Yariv Levine, as long as you don't vote for him, and that is that Yariv Levine is the only person besides Alon Dahl's in the Knesset who cared about electric vehicles, who understood that there is an energy transition and we have to get our fleet away from this fossil fuel dependence and addiction, and that we have to have an infrastructure of charging in order to make that possible. And he was the only person who would go with me to any hearings about this kind of thing. And I want to make a shout out for that, that even though we have very little in common on many, many issues on this, we certainly agree. Or there was my partner in crime, Gila Gamliel, who was the Minister of Environment before we took over. And I thought, in my opinion, better and closer to my perspective than the one who followed her was from the left. Uh, and she and I uh, ran the quarters of the Knesset tried to push biodiversity laws, and she wrote a climate law, which was better than the one that the new minister made, and uh, became a real friend, and somebody that I could rely on and to bring the opposition over on, on these issues. Um, I'll tell you another story. There's a communist party in Israel, not as big as it used to be, but it's called Hadash, and it's headed by a man named Ayman Oda, who's a very brilliant um, Arab Israeli from Haifa, and when we had coalitional problems and it wasn't clear we had a majority to pass legislation, the word went out, any environmental law you want to pass a law, you're going to have to bring people from the opposition. And people out from the opposition never vote for proposals of the coalition on your principle. But I drove up to Haifa and he walked to his room. I remember his office had flooded the night before, so we squeegeed it out. And then we sat and talked. And I started talking to him. This law, that law, that took too many to learn, let me spare you the time. Any environmental law you want, We'll break ranks with the opposition and vote for it. Now let's talk about politics. And we went on, because for him, that was not political. Um, and the last example I want to give of this is that one of the issues that concerns me very much is the um, overpopulation dynamics in Israel. The fact that quality of life is starting to compromise quality of life, and that our population is going to 2% a year, and that's, to my mind, unsustainable. I think the data bench and the organization that we've started to deal with this issue. And when I went to the Knesset, several people told me, you know, you only get a chance to make a first impression once. The first year in the Knesset, you should kind of play that issue. Well, it's very sensitive. People are going to think you're a little bit fanatical, whatever. And I heard that from former members of Knesset. But another member of uh, Knesset, a former minister of interior, works for, and worked for me at the time at the public policy department, of Heinz Paz, said, alone, this is your chance to make this issue care. So I went up to the Knesset and basically went public with Harry Kerry and talked about overpopulation. And there was a lot of pushback and a lot of nasty things said by my colleagues in the Knesset on social media. And instead of getting angry, I always invite whoever said something mean about me on this issue to have a cup of tea with me in the Knesset, um, in the Knesset dining room. We had very, very late hours because it was a very, very obnoxious opposition. So at two, three in the morning, there's nothing to do. And I would sit and explain to them that it's not that I'm against Israel, that it's not that I'm like the Pharaoh who wants to kill you know, Jewish babies, but that we have to think about it. And invariably, they would take down the posts. They would say, okay, if that's what you meant, I'm sorry. I didn't, that was not what I understood it to be. So I think that there is much more potential for getting along. The problem we have in Israel is that the political system is designed to reward politicians who play on our divisions, who manipulate small or even significant difference of opinion so that we forget about the majority of issues about which we actually agree and sometimes agree very, very passionately. So the question is, how do we make that? How do we change that? Well, one might say, well, how can we change that in the Knesset? The Knesset Israel's parliament is, um, is a parliament like many parliaments, where the members have two roles. You do two things when you're a parliamentarian. One, you write and pass legislation. And two, 
you provide oversight for the executive branch. And it turns out that if you look at Israel's Knesset, we are world champions in proposing legislation. Every Knesset, 1,500 laws, and there's no way we'd ever be getting it. But if you want to get a good headline, you put in the law and say, okay, you know, a long time I did it for a constitutional amendment for protecting the environment, a basic law for the environment. Boy, that was a great headline. Okay, but you know, there's a, so we're very good at putting in legislation that's not necessarily going to pass and very weak at this oversight. And let's unpackage this for a second and deconstruct it. Why are Israeli uh, legislators so weak, say, compared to the U.S. Senate or Congress in their oversight of the executive branch? And it has to do with the way the political system is designed. Because basically who is left in the Knesset are the backbenchers, the lower level politicians on the political parties list of the coalition. They're the ones who run the committees, okay? The senior members are ministers. They're the executive branch. Now, if I'm a ambitious uh, politician, young, just getting started off, lower, with aspirations, do I want to be a very, very um, conscientious, overseeing legislator who gives hell to all the ministers for not doing their jobs? That would be a very, very good way to send myself to political oblivion. So the system is designed so that it's a very, very anemic or friendly oversight system. And that is a problem, I think, to some extent, because it allows our executive branch, which already has way too much power, to have even more power because they don't have that checks and balances. It is on paper. There's a lot of things that a minister can't do unless he gets uh, permission from a legislative committee. But the chair of that committee may be from his own party, or it is, uh, he can, the minister can go to the chair of that person's party and say, you twist that person's arm, I need this passed. And it usually happens that way. Um, so what do Knesset members actually do if they don't pass legislation and, and uh, they don't necessarily have the most vigilant oversight? Well, here is the thing, is that members of Knesset in Israel don't necessarily have all that much power, but nobody knows that. So if you pretend that you have power, you can do a lot as a member of Knesset, okay? And um, just... Okay. I'll give you four examples of things I did, which are not that important, but I thought at the time there were. So, for example, we had a problem in the hills of Jerusalem where farmers were putting up fences and the gazelle population was getting caught in them. And then they would be killed by wolves, whatever other reasons were. And some of them suffocated to death or got choked to death. For the thing. And so there was a moshav up that way where that was a problem. And the Environmental activists, a group called uh, Natsili, the, the people who were standing in the hills of Jerusalem, they decided that they were going to um, make a campaign against this Moshav for being an enemy of nature. And the Moshav pushed back and nothing was happening. And then somebody said, why don't we get that call to be an arbitrator? Now, I didn't have any authority to bring the Moshav to the table, but the Moshav was so relieved not to, to be, and it provided the ladder they needed to come down from the tree so I could get the sides together and say, okay, what do we really want here? How can we do this? I mean, I had a, if I'd been in the class a little longer, I had this idea of creating a whole insurance plan. You know, farmers get money for uh, disasters, you know, floods and whatever. Why don't we give them, take down the fences and if a gazelle should eat your lettuce crop, we'll give you insurance for that. How much can it cost? Anyway, but that was an example of how we, you could bring people to the table. Um, as a member of Knesset, you can be a, uh, what they call a file and security brief. You can go and all of a sudden the courts listen to you or go to planning commissions. I went to planning commissions all over the country or they'd zoom me in and I could actually get time that you never get as a public uh, person. One of my favorite stories is what happened with the Chavua of Tel Aviv, a conservative congregation in Tel Aviv that for 20 years had been there in a um, High school, the Gymnasia of Herzliya, a big high school in Tel Aviv, in a room. And on Friday and Saturday, they would take out the closet their Torah scrolls and have their services and their community and put it back. And then a new principal came and decided, well, who are these people? We didn't know about it. So he told them they had a week to get out after 20 years. And they were beside themselves. And the president of the congregation called me up and I happened to be an active conservative Jew. So I immediately got the WhatsApp uh, and a number of the of the principal and sent him a letter that I just sent to the Minister of Education, who now is in my party, but he's a friend, saying, can you believe 
that your ministry is once again allowing the persecution of conservative Jews in Israel. And this principle, this, this, within two minutes, I got a phone call. There must be something there's misunderstanding. They don't really have to leave. So there's things you can do, which uh, there's particularly in terms of access to ministers, and that I think that give uh, more um, power and influence to Israeli uh, legislators in that way uh, to do that. Um, nonetheless, looking at the past Knesset, we rank them in terms of their toxicities, the dysfunctionality and the uh, polarization that existed in the past Knesset, 25th Knesset is unprecedented. And I think um, we have to think about ways that we can bring people together and get most of the people who come to the Knesset as idealists. Not all of them are just, uh, we're all opportunistic. I think that's the nature of being a politician, but they, there's good opportunists too. We want opportunities to do good things. So um, I want to offer some ideas what might change things and then talk about some of the sort of structural challenges we have in trying to reach a consensus. So um, the first thing you might ask is, well, Israel doesn't have geographic representation. And the thing about it, if you think about it, like in the US, you have geographic representation. When that happens, when a congressman or woman has constituents, then all of a sudden, they're not that beholden to their party. They listen to their party, but they mostly know that they're going to have to go to re-election, and that creates maybe the ability to have a little more independence. So would that be a good idea? Should Israel move to geographic representation? Would that provide more ability to reach consensus and allow people to break free of these political parties, which seem to be hell-bent on dividing the population instead of bringing them together? Well, first thing I want to say is I love to be able to pick my constituents. The best thing about member Kinesin is nobody voted for you. You decide who, you have, who you're representing. So I picked three constituencies, which obviously was for me environmentalists, and it was for reform and conservative Jews, and it was uh, women's groups, because I feel that there's not enough men who step on the issues involving uh, women's challenges, and, and I like that system. But um, if I look at it analytically about the American thing, I'm not so sure that the American system isn't as broken as the Israeli system in terms of the polarization and where that's going. And that the way the big funding of elections goes, there's uh, it's very hard to run against a national Party. So I'm not sure that Israel, if it did shift to geographic, and some people say they can make 60 of the sale of their Knesset members geographic and 60 other ones, or make the Knesset 180 and add 60 geographic representatives, maybe. I'm not so sure. Um, I would like to uh, suggest that um, maybe what we need to do is change the political dynamics. Right now we have a far-right government, and the previous government was characterized that's more of it, but it would always have a left government or a right government. I think we need to seek a muscular middle. That's not a term that I invented, but I think there is always been this perception that centrist parties are sort of wishy-washy, anemic, don't stand for anything. I think that's not true. I see that obviously uh, in the great Israeli tradition of shameless self-promotion as a centrist party uh, activist. But the truth of the matter is, I think the difference between a centrist party and a right and left party is they don't, they're not locked into the orthodoxy, which forces them to adopt an entire suite of agendas and policies, rather than look at each issue, but they can be just as passionate as they need to be. And in fact, when we think about it in our party, um, I have a friend who's part of the right of me, his name is Matan Kahane, he's a member of Knesset, he's, he was the previous minister of religion. He said, look, think about of all the Israeli politicians Let's rank them from one to seven, where one is the most far left person, and the number seven is the most far right, Ben Veer and the right wing racist Israel, and Jewish parties. He said, We need a government that's core support, the 61 seats that supports a Israeli government that comes from three, four, and five. He said, Now, the only person I know who's number four is, is, is Benny Gantz, who's uh, the head of the party's true center. He says, I'm, I'm a five, I'm on the right. You're probably a three, we're on the left. But we can agree about most things. And once we've done that, we can bring on the twos and the six as long as we're not dependent on them. And that's a nice thing in terms of theory, but it's not necessarily going to change anything in there. But I like to think of that as a, um, as a, a way to go. I think that um, before I talk about some specific issues, I think we have to remember just how different the Israeli political system is, and which makes it inherently problematic to make a consensus. So, for example, 
The um, fact that in Israel, we have many, many parties that represent many, many perspectives. You vote, there's 50, 60 different possibilities along the way, flavors. And we raised the threshold, but still 12, 13 different parties. Well, in some sense, you could say that's a very satisfying thing as a voter because some people feel like, well, look, uh, you know, the, the Republicans have some good things about them, but they've gone this way, the Democrats. I would like something that reflects my, you know, and that's in Europe, for example, if you're very green, you can vote for those kind of people. I mean, we've had parties in Israel that represent senior citizens. People say that's the most important thing. And they got, there was a, there was a feminist party for a few years. And these people, these are core heartfelt issues that people, that's what I want those representatives. The trouble is, is that then it's almost like trying to shepherd flies, you know, having so many different positions that we're pulling and it does leave the government very, very vulnerable to blackmail by small parties who have a disproportionate amount uh, of influence. So um, the advantage is you get a tremendous variety of views and maybe are much better reflection of the social mosaic in a country. But the downside is, is that you have small groups with maybe very narrow and parochial interests. Um, there's six central problems which I'm gonna raise and, and hopefully talk about over the next uh, five, 10 minutes which Israel needs to address as we move forward towards a more consensual and more effective government. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the role of the Supreme Court. For nine months, Israelis were very divided on this issue of what extent courts should have power. The people who were supporting the judicial reform said these are non-democratic elected these are elitists. People should be making policy are the members of the Knesset. And therefore, we are going to limit the Supreme Court's ability to um, reject laws of the Knesset, provide oversight over the executive branch. The other side of it, which was the majority of Israelis, as the protests gained momentum, said, no, wait a second. Democracy is not just about the rule of the majority. We need to have protection of individual rights. And we need to have a Supreme Court, which is independent, to, uh, to ensure that happens. Um, I think there's a short-term situation, a solution, and a long-term. As somebody who feels very strongly that the stronger Israel's Supreme Court is, the more secure our democracy is, I'm very concerned about that issue. The short-term is that things have gone very, very well since the war started. First of all, we had a very important decision by our Supreme Court, which the one law which was passed by our parliament which would have, uh, which would have led to the evisceration of the Knesset as an uh, executive oversight, where they couldn't throw out executive activities that were unreasonable. Right now, if a minister decides he's not going to give a license to somebody because their eyes are green, only people with brown eyes are going to get this. That's considered to be unreasonable, and they could be in the Supreme Court of the Thursday. And I can tell you, as an environmental attorney, that. The vast majority of environmental successes in the Supreme Court have to do with activities that are unreasonable. We say this, the law has been in place for four years and the minister still hasn't made the regulations. The Supreme Court says that's unreasonable. You have to make regulations. And so this, taking that away would have really harmed the environment. Well, that law was passed against the wishes of the president. They could have made it small anyway. And the Supreme Court said, no, this law is unconstitutional. So we don't have a constitution, so we don't care. We consider it's against constitutional principles. So that concern has been laid aside, and nobody wants to bring that law back, except for maybe the original thing and some of the other ones. The other thing that happened that gave the Supreme Court a big shot in the arm, in a strange, weird sort of way, is that Israel got sued or got taken to court by South Africa to the International Court of Justice on the issue of genocide, which is a ridiculous trumped up claim that it's absolutely nothing uh, that Israel's doing in the Gaza Strip with all of the tragic collateral damage that has anything to do with genocide, with the intention of genocide to wipe people off the earth. However, what happens when you go to the Hague, you have to appoint a 16th judge. If you're being tried, you get that right. And Netanyahu had to bring somebody who's very, very influential in the international community. And the judge that he asked to represent Israel was Aaron Barak, even though he's 86 years old, he's still got his full capacities there. And he was the most activist judge in Israeli history. 
As a judge and later as chief justice, I was considered to be something of a whipping boy, a target of the anti judicial, the, the, the pro judicial foreign activist. If you see, it's Aaron Barak, and all of a sudden, he was the national hero who was standing up in the court at Hague. And the implication was the fact that Israel has a activist, independent Supreme Court, gives us this ability to go to the Hague and say no. Because when Israel, whatever reason, Israel's military tries to do something which might violate international law, it goes right to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court basically cancels it. And Barack could say that in the first person because he did it many, many times. So these two things together and the fact that those people who were so in favor of the judicial reform saw, oh, this isn't just rhetoric. We actually need an act of the Supreme Court because we have adversaries around the world who would otherwise try to embarrass us or, or shame us or do worse things to us at the court of the Hague. We need an act of this court. That got a lot of things. Um, I would say that it doesn't mean that we can't change the Supreme Court. There's a lot of small things we could change, but I think we want to listen to our very wise president which you heard, so I don't do things slowly and not in the bull in the china shop style of this past government. I think also it's very well that we all remember, and Israelis in particular, there's a basic misapprehension about the role of the courts in general. There are some things courts are there to do, okay? They're there to ensure that the government runs in a fair, transparent, legal way, okay? But they're not there to make policy. And um, I remember I had a situation that really uh, demonstrated this when um, I was a member of a city council, regional council, and uh, the chair, newly elected chair of this regional council, the mayor, was Udi Gat. Because some people who know Udi, so I'm going to tell the story there. And at the time, there was a proposal to put an airport right in the heart of the Ain of Rona Nature Reserve. It was a nature reserve that had been designated but not officially declared yet. And I thought that was a really, really bad idea. So I went around, the, the 13 members I was at the time representing my kibbutz, and I was living down south there, and I got, I think there were 17 people that I was on the council, and I got 13 of them to say, absolutely, I'm totally opposed to this, we should not destroy it, they have to find another site. And four of them had somebody back to them first, okay? But most importantly, the chair was against it. So we had the meeting to vote, down this proposal. And in flew in a very, very smart and conscientious lawyer by the name of Alona Kao from Adam Tevedi, which is an organization that I founded, which is a legal organization. And she appeared in front of the council and said, you don't have even the authority to discuss this because there's not a proper environmental impact statement. And it's this kind of thing. And going on and on and on and said, I demand that this hearing be closed down. And so the chair of the regional council, he got turned to the council we have, one word up here, we have another professor of environment law here, uh, Professor Tal, what is your opinion on this issue? I said, well, you know, she has some points, but on the other hand, there are positions that would say there, that if the council go ahead and make this decision. I looked at Alona, and she had smoke coming out of her ears. What happened to Alona Tal? How is he allowing us to go, to go forward? And so we had the vote, and guess what? 13 to four, it was defeated. And today the airport is located right across from the Timna, uh, former mines where it was damaged land, the right place for this new airport for your life. But the point was, I went to her afterwards, I said, listen, I know you're really angry about me, but when you cool down, you realize that even at best, all you could do was delay this by a year. And then we have to come back. And I have the votes now, and I've got a green head of the council, and we won, celebrate, you know. But the point is that that's a good thing because on some decisions, the courts don't need to make, decide whether or not an airport should be here or there. That's for democracy to decide. So we have to find the right balance on that issue as well. Um, another issue which I think we think about is really democracy and we're trying to reach it. What about all the Israelis who live outside of Israel, Israeli citizens, some of them are in this room, who don't get to vote, okay? I mean, um, I get to vote when I, uh, in American elections, and you can be sure I'm gonna vote now. It's not a political, American political thing. You can guess who I'm gonna vote for. But um, the, the truth of the matter is, is in Israel, anybody who doesn't live in the, uh, is not living in the country, is outside and doesn't get to vote. And uh, this became, I think, that even more important issue when we saw that about 15,000 Israelis who are backpacking around the world got on a flight, sometimes sitting on the floors of special Charlie uh, LL jets to come back and fight. And yet, if there had been elections, their voice would not have been counted. And there's lots of people who are 
they're engaged in our, you know, working through a high tech company abroad. Why shouldn't they get the vote? So I actually filed a law with a member of Knesset from the Merits, which said, let's let people have um, the right to vote, Israeli citizens, even if they don't live in the country. And the political feasibility, the likelihood of that passing is zero. But I thought it was an important statement. And the reason why it's zero is because the every party is trying to figure out, well, who are they going to vote for? Are they going to be the cab drivers in Queens who are going to vote for the could? Sorry about the, the stereotype. Or the, the high-tech Silicon Valley workers who are going to vote for the center left. And that, whatever the reason is, very unlikely. But I think that's an issue which we need to think about. And we need to broaden our vision of who a, who's got its place at the table. Um, extremism. Israel's legislators are increasingly dogmatic. That's a nice way to put it. Some of them are absolutely lunatics, internally on the right, and even sometimes on the left. And I think one of the reasons why is because of primaries. Hmm. What do you mean? What happens in primaries, and it kind of happens here too, if you look at some of the ways the dynamics of certain parties, is that uh, the playing to the base of a political party is very different than playing to the national electorate. So in the primaries, when people get elected, people say things that are extremely, extremely uh, vitriolic and, and uh, you know, bombastic, and maybe, so it, it rewards people who are extremists. And more importantly, if you take the example of Israel, a party like we could, a significant percentage of its voters are settlers, very far right-wing people, who don't vote for the party in the national elections, only in the primaries. They assign it, but they can influence and make sure that there's as many right-wingers as possible. So our party, Bloomer, came up with an alternative idea, which I think is a really good idea, which is this. When you go to vote, right now, Israel has a voting system from the 1950s. You take, a, uh, you pull a little piece of paper with the name of your party, the letter that represents you, put an envelope, you stick it in there. You know, stuff they've been doing for, since the Magna Carta, whenever democracy began. And instead we said, let's use modern technology. And you only get to vote for a primary, the candidates of the party, if you vote for that party. So if I'm voting for a party, I get to rank the top 10 people on the list that I want. But only if I've got skin in the game, only if I'm voting for them. I think that would do a lot to make the um, a more reasonable cast of characters in a legislature who could then work together for the common good. That's another uh, idea that I wanted to do. I would abolish primaries all together. Uh, another problem we have is the instability of the government. We didn't know this. There was five elections in succession. You know, it's already worse than Italy. It's worse than, you know, what's going on here? So um, there are ways you could do with changes. For example, right now you can have a no-confidence vote. Basically, you could have 61 to 59, and the government would change, okay? But what if we said it was 75 to 45? 45, would that be a good thing? Maybe. That would be better. The other thing you have, the government follows and it can't pass a budget. Maybe we should pass budgets for two years or three years. And then we wouldn't have to take the risk all the time of the government falling. I think there's things we could do to make our government more um, stable. Church and state. There's no issue which sometimes rouses Israelis against the more set one against the other than the government's intervention in matters of faith, okay? making rules that say that you can't travel a certain time or you can't eat. My last government ostensibly fell the government because one of the ministers was insulted by a merits health minister who didn't want to ban bread in hospitals during Passover. That's why the government fell. That was what she said. I can't allow this Jewish state of Israel to be besmirched by a minister who's insensitive to the members of like 20% of people in the hospital are Arabs. Don't they get to eat pizzas on, on them? But it didn't help her. She was set to go and off she went. So um, maybe we want to separate church and state. And I, my wife feels that very strongly. So after 20, 30 years of dinner time conversations, she's kind of starting to have her influence on me. But it's never going to happen. That's one of those things where the political feasibility, I think, is very, very small. Um, and the last thing um, I want to talk about is this notion that Israel is a wonderful, diverse uh, mosaic of cultures, but some of the differences run very, very deep. And we have real profound differences on things like the status of women, my view, and the view of the ultra-Orthodox population, which is growing very quickly. Very, very different whether they should be in the public sphere or not. Military service, cannabis. You know, we would have legalized marijuana completely, except it was actually the Islamic party that 
stopped it. Otherwise, we'd have, and I mean, I tried when I was in the Knesset, I was on the committee for the drugs and alcohol, whatever, and the, the, there's a guy, a young member of the Knesset, Ram Shepard from Labor, was the chair, and he brought me on there because he thought, you're, you're an American stoner or something, you'll, you'll be a great supporter. And so I said, let me chair the next meeting, two meetings. So I said, I have a topic, we're going to talk about legalization of mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms. And he said, why is that? I said, because I'm going to make you a moderate. If I go out there and talk about how important about mushrooms for raising consciousness and so good for post-trauma, and we had those two hearings that were great, really interesting, um, but we didn't get past that. But the point is, is there's a lot of things we disagree about. Refugee policy, very, very divided. And so people say, maybe what we need is a Swiss canton system or a more federalist system. If you want to be uh, whitewashing, you could say maybe you want to empower local governments more. But the point is that Israel, rather than having being always at war with itself, maybe we just want to live and let live. And that's very hard because I don't want to sit there and look at ultra-Orthodox cantons which don't allow uh, women to go in the front of the bus and things like that. However, I also recognize that they have very, very different perspectives than me. And if I don't want them to tell me how to live, maybe I don't have the right to tell them how to live. So there was actually a television series on this very possibility where Israel had divided into two kingdoms. There was the kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem and Israel on the, on the, um, on the, uh, in the West Coast. And I actually will, um, uh, there's a story about two fish that goes into that issue. But the point is, this is something that happened. It's not going to happen without a constitutional convention. Israel was supposed to have a constitution when it was founded. It's part of the Declaration of Independence. And then Ben-Gurion said, well, why would I want a constitution? That's just going to tie my hands. I can do whatever I want. I've got a big majority in the Knesset. So it never happened. And now we kind of think that although he did many, many great things and had many, many smart decisions, this might have been a big mistake. We needed a constitution. We need one now. And whether or not we can find the leadership to make that happen is not. But I definitely think that um, Israel has a core set of values, which is found in the Declaration of Independence. I actually printed out here, but given the time that I want to leave time for questions, I won't read through the specific points of it. But basically, I think those are the values which do unify all Israelis now more than ever. So let's see if we can't use the this moment of grace. We talk in Jewish tradition about et son, when maybe the gates of heaven are open a little bit better. And uh, when we are reminded how much we actually have in common, Arabs, Jews, Orthodox, secular, uh, you name it. And we also see how vulnerable you are, how we have to work together to find a way to make our democracy more consensual and more harmonious. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, any come through the, uh, no? Yeah. Please, Shana. I really just introduce yourself, please, for the uh, for the Zoom. Oh, this actually works. Yeah, I don't need this. I don't talk that much. <laughs> I I was wondering. We were your names. So uh, you mentioned refugees several times, and I'm wondering if you're talking about the refugees who came from uh, up north and came to find refuge. Elsewhere in the country, or are you talking about who are you talking about? That's an excellent question because I spoke about two very different kinds of refugees. The initial reference was to refugees who used to live on the northern border with Lebanon. And anybody within four or five kilometers of the border had to leave because it wasn't dangerous. And people who lived six kilometers felt that they should have been allowed to leave because their hotels would not have been paying, but they have to face a fairly constant barrage of missiles and, and, and shelling from, from Lebanon. And of course, the people from the Gaza envelope who, after the trauma of uh, October 7th, just want to get the hell out of there until safe. That's one group of refugees, Jewish refugees from Israel who are fleeing a war that they didn't ask for. The other group of refugees are people who've come almost largely from Africa to Israel illegally and made their way here. Now, uh, Israel has a unique status. We are the only Western wealthy nation in the world to which somebody in Africa can walk. Okay, And so for a long time, a lot of them did. And all of a sudden, we woke up with 40, 50,000 illegal uh, you know, refugees. And we said, wow, um, this is not so sustainable. We have poor people of our own, whatever. Several of them said, yes, but we come from Eritrea. And Eritrea is a horrible 
um, despotic regime where people are forced into military service and we're escaping with, for our lives. And we are political, seeking political asylum. And Israel is a signee on the uh, international treaty to accept these kind of refugees. Some people, as argued, were more what we call it, economic refugees. They came from parts of Africa that they just would like to get a well-paying job. So um, there are two different kinds of, I mean, there's a long continuum. The extremists don't want anybody. The most uh, liberals say, well, come on, come all. And most of us say we have to create criteria. It's unimaginable to me, and I remember I made a speech in the Knesset about this, so I'll give it a little bit of a synopsis of it, but here, uh, what happened was is there was a, a debate over this issue, and it happened to fall on the day when, I think it was in September, whatever, when the Evian conference took place in 1938. For those of you who didn't know, uh, the 1938 was clear what was brewing in Europe, and so there was a refugee conference, which actually President Roosevelt convened. 38 countries came to talk about what they're going to do. And so it was, it was very much of a, you know, it was all using these, it was all about the Jews. How, who's going to take in Jews? And the answer was nobody. Only the Dominican Republic was the only country that was willing to take in Jews. So it's unimaginable to me that the state of Israel wouldn't have some sort of policy to take in, not we can't take them all in, but take our fair share. That's my own personal view. Um, some people don't feel that way. So that, that's the two different kinds, and uh, both of them are very, very different. I hope that the first kind of these is temporary and ephemeral. We won't find an alternative without finding a um, I know you're not a prima donna alum, but I think I should do the schlepping. <laughs> Thank you, Alon, for a very uh, interesting talk. I'm Gil Ribach, Associate Professor at the Arizona Center for Judaic Studies. You raised a couple of interesting things, and then you said, well, you know, but that's not feasible. And, and I, I want to ask you about, you know, you wrote a, a very famous book, and the land is full, about the demographic problem, which, of course, would, would have religious people, both Jews and Muslims, even Christians, come up in, in arms and say, who are you to, you know, plan our families and all that. But that has also to do with the Constitution. I mean, one of the reasons, yeah, Ben Gurion didn't want to tie his own hands, but today when you have 30% of the Jewish population consider themselves as Orthodox, and from that 30%, a, a vast majority sees the halakha as their constitution and not some man-made legislation. It's a tall order. I, I mean, and, and I'm asking you, how do you think it will be feasible, both in terms of demographics and both, both in terms of constitution? And of course, what you told your wife, that before separation of church and state, Religion and state, not true. Religion and state in Judaism is very problematic. Ethnicity and religion are really interwoven. So, how do you think we can move forward? And you you seek the unifier and, and what's unifying us, but but those are really fundamental questions. How do you see us moving forward with them? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for. Um, giving my book, The Land of uh, Land is Full, the status of the famous and most, I thought the only person who read that book was my mother. And apparently there was one other person, so thanks for that. Um, look, everything you said is absolutely correct. These are complicated issues. I would like to hope, first of all, that even the 30% of Israelis who are religious and are very serious about God's expectations realize that to impose a halachic religious regime on the, the country would be the, uh, the end of the country. Because the non-Orthodox Israelis, if they did succeed in doing it in this kind of government, it might actually be possible. The non will pick up and leave. We saw something as little as weakening the Supreme Court, which, which of course would not have allowed that kind of things. People are seriously thinking about leaving because they're concerned about the future of democracy. And we all saw the war in Gaza how important the non-Orthodox, and the Orthodox is very much doing their part in, in the war, but how much we need to all be on deck, all hands on deck for the war. So I think there's much more um, pragmatic pragmatism amongst the, the Orthodoxes than we would have seen. And I would also say that um, not all of them are unhappy with a constitutional legal regime that's not a lot. Certainly women, I think, there, as much as they would play lip service to the importance of God's law, would be very happy to live in a country that guaranteed them equal rights because, rights because traditional Judaism has a certain misogynist flavor to it. And they're, they're well aware of that every single day. So I'm not so sure how much they would be uh, opposed to that. And I'm, I'm encouraged by the number of attorneys amongst Orthodox politicians who kind of are, have <laughs> sort of a, sort of have a double down on the Israeli legal system. 
Um, with regard to the uh, issue of the birth rates, first of all, it's noted that Arabs, one of the major changes in Israeli society in the last 10 years is that Muslim women now give birth to fewer children than Jewish women. That's something which happened relatively quickly, um, but the, the concerns about uh, you know, the Arabs have been out, those concerns were valid in the 1950s and 60s if they were ever about. They're certainly ridiculous today. Um, and so, uh, and the reason is very clear, according to you. There's three reasons why the Arab fertility rates have dropped, and that's empowering women, empowering women, empowering women, all the rest is coming to it. So, um, so I don't think they are the problem. Certainly not the Christian Arab. They're down to one point eight kids. They want to have them. so, but but there is a question of uh, the veteran population still has four and a half five kids on average, and the uh, ultra orthodox still have seven, and that, that is an issue. Um, it's complicated, and I uh, dealt with it a lot. The only political partner I had on this particular issue was uh, Victor Lieberman, who's then the Minister of Finance, who uh, understands the economic implications of having the present. Demographic patterns be what they are. Um, I hope that we find a solution to it, but your skepticism is well deserved and just. Um, so you alluded several times to the war as a unifying factor, which then leads me to wonder when, maybe soon, the war ends or it pauses, does the unity hold? And what happens, you know, what happens then? Because I think we're already starting to see it fraying, right? We're starting to see the, the protests, the hostage families and the protests. There was a women's protest yesterday, today, where they shut down streets. Um, so can you speak a little bit to that? And yeah, to this moment that we're in, Today. Well, given that's an excellent question, we can only hope. I think a great deal depends on whether this present government is willing to, in good faith, return the mandate to people and say, we want to run again. If you still think we're the best people to run the country, that's great. And if not, we will step down. And if that happens, then I think, yes, we can hold on to you. I think if this government, which according to all the polls, would not today be able to put together a coalition, um, refuses to cede power, I think there's going to be uh, the mother of all political demonstrations, millions of people demanding, because of the, the visceral anger and the enormous human loss to Israelis has left the, the people who are uh, furious with this government, it's expanded the pool. And the other thing is this, um, I spent five elections looking for what's known in Hebrew as the soft right. People who are on the right side of the political map, but believe in the rule of law, who aren't uh, radical uh, anti-Palestinians, but they have concerns about security. And the assumption was that there's a large population like that, and if we could just tell them there's this new party of rule, and you, you really want to vote with us and not with you, good, we would actually be able to flip the electoral results. And after five elections, I said, I know that there's some really smart strategists for our party who believe that, but the truth is, they're delusional. It doesn't exist. I've been everywhere looking for these soft right constituents. They're not out there. But they are. And we see that in the polls now. And if that happens, we can really get to that three, four, and five model if we return to one through seven ranking of people's political uh, inclinations and maybe bring together. And that is the key to have a prime minister who's whole political strategy and core is based on the muscular middle and not placating the far extremes of the own party, okay? And so I think that could happen. So I'm hopeful, and I hope I'll be on that centrist team. And um, we will have to wait and see because it, I could actually see us going back just as, uh, just as quickly as we uh, managed to come to. Israel's a hard place to predict. <laughs> And that's what makes it so interesting to live in the third Jewish comment. So this is from our online audience. How does the Palestinian the question? It's anonymous. Okay, take it on. <laughs> How does the Palestinian population in the West Bank and Gaza and Israel proper 
fit into the reorganization of the government in the future? How will this be handled? Very, very important question. But of course, the question is, which government are we talking about? Because the present government has a very, very powerful element of people who are settlers who are very committed to what we say one state solution. We don't believe that the Palestinian national aspirations are legitimate, or even if they were legitimate, they would think that they endanger both Israeli security and their God-given mandate for a Jewish state in their Judea and Samaria. And there's a lot of people who feel that in the present government, even though they're not, they're disproportionately represented for a variety of reasons. So if this government continues its rule and uh, or if they get reelected, then I would think they would give precious little uh, concern about the human rights and the aspirations of the Palestinians in the West Bank, as it goes without saying. However, if it's a blue and white uh, party that, that wins the election, or Benny Gantz becomes the prime minister, I think that what we can see from his uh, record as the minister of defense, how hard he worked to make life better for Palestinians in very, very practical, ways, things like giving people access to jobs and removing barriers of roads and inviting the Palestinian president to his house for, for coffee and to talk and show that kind of and symbolic but actual practical things as well. And um, I can only tell you what um, what Minister Gantz, today's the minister of the government, said to me when I talked about this trip. And I said, what should I tell them? What do you have to say? What you can tell them? He said, but the difference between me and Bibi Netanyahu is that Netanyahu wants to get rid of the Hamas and eliminate them so he can continue with the status quo to do nothing. And I want to eliminate the Hamas because I think that's the only way we can move forward to a more peaceful resolution of our problems. So if you're voting in the Israeli elections, there you have it. That's the only one to vote for us, but it really is a question. You can't, it's such an alternative perspective on this issue of the Palestinians that it's, uh, it's impossible to say that it's going to go one way or the other. It depends on the uh, this may be the last question. I don't know if anybody anything through the uh, through the well. Okay, we go. I hope this doesn't uh, mean the last of every, everything. Uh, my name is Mike, and I'm not a politician. I'm not a Israeli. I'm not an academic. I'm just somebody who listens to the news and things that. Before the war, you described the, the division uh, very, very markedly. And after the war, that division, in many respects, evaporated. And you started out at the beginning, and I came in late, so I didn't hear your first five minutes. But it seems to me that the current government that rarely gets said before the before and I'm just talking about before the war was actually in my mind leading toward a theocracy. It was reminding me more of what's going on in Iran than what's happening in Israel before the war. That's that's gone off the table now, to, to my mind. But what seems to have come up on the table is there's no way, and I'm talking about the general Israeli population. There's no way that a two-state solution would ever be possible at this point. Well, there's great wisdom in what you say. I would offer the following uh, comments. The 7th of October was certainly uh, the worst day in Israel's history, the most bloody day in Jewish history since the Holocaust, and that's true. But it was also probably the worst day ever for Palestinian national aspirations as well. That although Hamas stated intent was to liberate Palestine, but they just did the opposite because the pushback that it created, the visceral fear of giving more rights and opportunities to Palestinians in the West Bank or in Gaza, they grew enormously. And not uh, irrationally so amongst the Israelis. I myself question whether or not some of the things I was willing to do in the past to make peace make sense then, and whether I was being and so optimistic and controlled by some sort of cognitive dissonance that I so much wanted to that I just did not see reality as it was. However, and this was um, something I talked today in the Bill House, but I think there are some things which can give us reason to believe 
that we will be able to move forward. First of all, the world seems like they are going to support Israel because they understand how important it's given to Hamas, but they also recognize that Palestinians have legitimate national aspirations, and Israel's going to have to show a little bit more uh, volition and flexibility to that forward. Second of all, I'm a big believer in the potential of demilitarization to be a central part of the next stage. I've talked to right wing politicians. I have that problem. I like to hear the other side things, but it's the advantage of being a politician comes from academia. And when you ask them, would it bother you if there was a Palestinian state that was completely demilitarized? They said, you mean they wouldn't have any arms except whatever the police have to leave the fantasy? And then we'll say, yeah, that's okay. That's what we got to the town, folks. So whatever you want. Well, that's what I want, too. And I think we have enough of a positive history with demilitarized states after wars of aggression to think that this might be a model that could work here. Think about Japan between 1945 and 1952. They were forbidden from having any arms, and then later that was extended with uh, the Treaty of San Francisco, which Germany in 1945 and 55, no army whatsoever. It was certainly very good for their economy. They didn't have to waste all this money on militaries. They could put it into the auto industry and all the other things that happened in those years. And it might be that the Palestinians, when they are urged by the and bribed by the wealthier nations of the Middle East to get with the program already, because Iran is the real enemy, they might say, okay, if we're going to have move towards a state that just won't have an army, I think that's something which everybody now with the, you know, how we call it rhetorically, what, the, what the, the name is, you know, Rose is a rose by any other name to them. But I think that's something which could fly. Yeah, sure. So, can I just make a, a comment? Because we are out of time. Sure. Just uh, take your time. Because you only have interesting things to say. No, um, but I'll talk to you later. But I did send around to a number of people, and I don't know if anybody in the room watched the Washington Post live stream by Ben Ross this morning for 30 minutes. And I just looked up, they have some of his comments on here. He was a former U.S. envoy to the Middle East during the very multiple uh, administrations. Interestingly, he talked quite a bit about demilitarizing Gaza. He didn't talk about demilitarizing all of a future Palestinian state. And so I would just encourage people, I mean, he's very knowledgeable and very connected, um, just in line with the demilitarization, he focused on Gaza there. And just want to mention that. Sure. I, I think yeah. it's not the main thing. Yes, you get the last word. So, yeah, yeah just mention yeah. Dennis Ross. Dennis Ross, Washington, uh, Post. Washington Post, and we'll find it. And Dennis Ross is certainly a, a senior statesman in this area with experience on the Republican administrations and Democrats, and he's worth listening to. Um, look, there's no question that. Israel's population converged on October 7th. We all took a step to the right to some extent, myself included, certainly my household, which is I'm surrounded by uh, wives and daughters who are significantly from left away. And they, and they also, we found, and we found that we found ourselves agreeing about things we never agreed about before. But if we go with the Dennis Ross plan or whatever it's going to be, it's going to have to be widely accepted by Israeli society. And that's the goal, I think, of this conversation. If we're going to make a step forward, Israel has to maintain, it has to be have a broad mandate from the people. Because if there's one thing we learned in Gaza, we knew it all along, but it's very clear, is that you won't have a country survive unless there's a significant number of men, now we know women, between the ages of 18 and 30, who are willing to go and put their lives on the line and make it happen. We live in a tough neighborhood. And so we have to have a give the soldiers of our country, the sense that they are truly representing the national interest, which is accepted by all. I think we have a very robust democracy. It's flawed. As you can hear, we have a lot of challenges, but hopefully we will be able to address those challenges and provide the kind of uh, Jewish state that we can all be proud of. So thank you so much, and have a good one. Thank you.